we are happy to to have uh, Kevin Kevin Zelaya who is uh, who is talking today. Uh, he is uh, he has been a postdoctoral uh, fellow for from uh, last year <laughs> in two thousand nineteen, <laughs> and um, so he he has uh, completed his PhD in um, Mexico. And he, he will be ha happy to talk about some joint work we, we have been doing together. So please, uh, Kevin, your turn. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Professor. So, yes, well, as, as Professor Veronique uh, just say, well, work we just finished with uh, well, in collaboration with Ian Marquette. So just a thing, uh, I, sometimes my connection, uh, well, it's a bit unstable. So it, it may happen that, that I freeze for just a few seconds. In, in such a case, please uh, uh, just let me know if, if something is going wrong. <laughs> so, well, today's talk is about well, a, a current project well, uh, regarding uh, the construction and the study of time-dependent uh, models in quantum mechanics. So we have been doing uh, quite some research in this regard, but quite recently we found a new way to generate new time-dependent Hamiltonians for non-relativistic uh, quantum mechanics. And in this case, we are relying on the solutions, or in a, let's say, in a, in a connection with the four Pahlavi equation. So, <clears throat> well, uh, just uh, the outline of my talk, I will just briefly talk about the factorization method in the for a stationary system. My goal is, uh, well, it's not to, to talk about the factorization method for a stationary system, but it's quite, it's necessary to discuss in more detail what is the idea and how to extend such a method for time dependent problems because, well, such a task is not uh, so trivial. So then I will just briefly talk about the parametric oscillator. Parametric oscillator is basically like a prototype example of so exactly solvable uh, system in, in quantum mechanics. And the parametric oscillator is basically a harmonic oscillator interaction. But in this case, the frequency de depends explicitly on time. So this make the complete Hamiltonian an explicit function of time. And with these two basic ideas, I will discuss uh, what's the meaning of shape invariance uh, in, the, in the regard of time-independent system and how the shape invariance can be related to the quantum invariance of the system we are going to discuss. By doing so, we will be able to not only get the Hamiltonian, but we'll be also able to get the spectral information, such as the eigenvalues of a non-stationary uh, eigenvalue equation. I will talk about a bit about this in a moment, and as well as the solutions to the Schrodinger equation. So then we will discuss uh, how exactly the Ermakov and the Pahlavi equations define exactly the models we are going to study and how to get an explicit solution depending on some parameters we will introduce in a moment. So well, this is basically the outline for this talk. So first, uh, well, the stationary system and, and the factorization method. It, through through all this uh, this talk, I will well I will make a distinction between the Schrödinger equation, the eigenvalue equation, and the non-stationary eigenvalue equation. So by Schrödinger equation is basically well, the customary definition. By Schrödinger equation, I mean uh, this equation right here, which is basically the evolution of the Hamiltonian of it, 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 which is related, sorry, to the evolution of the Hamiltonian of it. Uh, for a stationary system, it's pretty well known that this, this partial differential equation in general can be decomposed into a stationary one just by using the conventional uh, uni uh, evolution operator, which is an unitary operator. And in this case, if the Hamiltonian do not depend explicitly on time, well, it's well known that the, Sch the Schrodinger equation can be reduced to an eigenvalue equation like this, where E are the eigenvalues, phi are the eigenfunctions, and the solutions to the Schrodinger equation are just basically these eigenfunctions times uh, a complex phase. 
So this is uh, valid, of course, for a, stas uh, for a stationary system or time independent Hamiltonians. So in a moment, I will talk about how to extend this idea to time dependent models. So uh, for stationary systems, there is uh, a well-known technique which is used to construct new exactly solvable models uh, by departing from an uh, initial system which is exactly solvable. By exactly solvable, I mean uh, that we know what is the Hamiltonian and we know all the eigenfunctions and all the eigenvalues. That's the definition we are going to use for exactly solvable systems. So uh, along the uh, well, throughout this work, we are going to talk about the inner product we, uh, in quantum mechanics. This is the definition for the inner product in coordinates representation. And even for time dependent systems, we will stick to this definition. There are several works in which well, people modify the inner product for time dependent systems. But in this case, we will preserve this one because uh, physically speaking, this is related to transition probabilities and uh, probability distributions. So uh, this is the definition we are going to use. What is the measure? Uh, oh, well, uh, it depends. But in, in this case, the, the measure is just a constant one. But we will find, uh, actually, I will talk about this in a moment, that these five functions can be decomposed as a measure function and a polynomial solution. So the measure in the case for polynomial solutions, the measure it's inside this phi function. So in general, uh, this is the inner product. And if we have any measure, it will be included in the functions themselves. So the domain is so, always yeah. a segment of the real axis? Uh, well, in, the, in general, is the, is the domain is the, the domain of the potential. Uh, it can be the, the complete real line. It could be the half real line or just a bounded interval. It is defined by the potential at the end. So, the, yeah, sorry, this is what I meant by the domain of the potential. <clears throat> so, just a briefly summary about the factorization method. Well, the factorization method is a technique that will allow us to uh, factorize any Hamil stationary Hamiltonian like this. And basically, the idea is to uh, introduce two new operators, A and A dagger such that uh, the Hamiltonian factorized like this. And this epsilon is a constant, which is, well, by, by construction, it's fixed uh, to be lower than the ground state of the system. This condition is, uh, well, uh, impl it's imposed because otherwise we will introduce some singularities in the, in the new potentials, and we don't want to add additional singularities to the potential. So, the explicit form for this uh, operator is given by this uh, first order dif differential operator. And beta is what well, is uh, it satisfies the Riccardi, uh, the Riccardi equation with uh, re uh, related to the potential. So if we know, if we fix the initial potential, we need, uh, in order to define beta, we need to solve this Riccardi equation. In this case, uh, we will uh, constrain to the real case in which beta is a real value function. There are several works in which beta can be complex, but for the time being, we are not dealing with a problem. So uh, in this way, we can invert the factorization. Remember, initially the factorization is a dagger a, and in this case is a a dagger. By doing so, it's well, and after doing some cal calculations, we realize that the new Hamiltonian defines a new potential, which is given by this. Uh, it's the initial potential plus the derivative of beta. So if we solve the Riccardi equation, we get this deformation, we get the new potential, and also uh, the eigenvalue equation related to the, uh, with the new Hamiltonian H1, it's completely defined by this set of relations. This is, these are called intertwining relationships. And the new eigenfunctions are just mappings of the solutions for the initial Hamiltonian given by the, uh, the same uh, factorization operators. So if we, that's why we need an exactly solvable system uh, to begin with. Because if we know these uh, phi n zeros, we can generate all the phi n plus one, one solutions. And the eigenvalues are exactly the same with the exception of an additional ground state fixed at epsilon. 
So this is why epsilon was initially lower than the ground state. So I will not spend too much time in, in too many details about this, but as, just as an, a simple example, for instance, we know the harmonic oscillator, its pre, uh, solutions are pretty well known, are her, Hermit polynomials. And well, regarding Professor uh, uh, John Question, for instance, uh, the measure for the Hermit polynomials is included inside the, the phi function. So that's why it doesn't appear in the definition for the inner product. And then I will do the same with the rest of the solutions. So the eigenvalues are like this. The solutions to the Riccati equation can be fine just by linearizing the Riccati equation. This is a pretty standard procedure. So we introduce these ansets. We, we get a new differential equation for U, which is uh, given by this eigenvalue epsilon. And in general, the, the most general solution for any epsilon is given by this. So I, I will use these solutions uh, later for the time dependent system. So for the time being, I, I, I just wanted to ex, uh, make an example of how to use the factorization method. So with U, we get beta and with beta, we get the potential, we get the mappings and we get the new eigenfunctions. And just an example, for instance, the green line, he, uh, well here, the green line defines the initial uh, harmonic oscillator potential. The red and the blue lines define some, uh, the new potential that we generate by this method. Uh, of course, there are several, uh, well, there are new parameters like lambda here, which is, well, uh, it's arbitrary to some, to some extent. And well, this is the new potential and these are the solutions. Uh, as, as I mentioned, I, I don't want to spend too much time in the stationary case, but this idea of factorizing the Hamiltonian is something that we'll expl exploit in the following uh, slides, but in, in a modified way. And this, base, uh, this uh, summarizes the procedure. This is the initial Hamiltonian. These are the, eigen, uh, the eigenvalues, sorry. So the new Hamiltonian H1, it uh, has the same eigenvalues. Uh, with the addition of this E01, which is epsilon. And we can move from one, uh, well, this generates a vector space. This is a complete vector space. So we can move from one vector space to the other just by using these mappings. The only mapping which is not defined is the lowest one, because if I use the mapping a dagger with this state, I will arrive to the uh, null state of the initial uh, uh, Hamiltonian. But besides, uh, uh, besides this one, well, the rest of the spectrum and the mappings are well defined. So this is, uh, I mean, uh, this is something that has been well explored during the last two decades and even more. So the, all this technique is well known in the stationary regime and set many other systems has been generated uh, uh, besides the harmonic oscillator. So now we will use uh, uh, we will modify the idea and we will use the parametric oscillator as a, as a departing point. So uh, just to briefly uh, recall, this is the Hamiltonian that, uh, which defines the uh, parametric oscillator. And this, uh, as you can see here, this function omega is, depends explicitly on time. And this is an ar arbitrary function we can introduce later. The only constraint is that uh, omega squared should be positive, uh, a positive function. Otherwise, this oscillator interaction will be negative and we will have some additional problem. So this is the only constraint for omega for the timing. So the main problem with this Hamiltonian is that we cannot decompose the Schrodinger equation into an eigenvalue equation because the, the standard procedure of introducing the unitary operator is, is no longer valid because of the explicit time dependence. However, Lewis and Riesenfeld, well, back in the 1969, they found that there is a workaround to solve this problem and basically take the time dependent Hamiltonian and put, uh, put this problem in, in similar grounds to the stationary case. And to do so, uh, Lewis and Riesenfeld, they realized that if we find a quantum invariant defined by the evolution in the Heisenberg picture, if there is an operator i uh, such that is its total derivative is null zero, and well, we know from the Heisenberg picture that the total derivative is given by this. So if there exists such an operator, 
it can it might happen because it's not always uh, guaranteed but it, it may happen that this operator satisfies an eigenvalue equation with eigenvalues which are uh, time independent and the condition to get this uh, uh, this stationary eigen uh, non stationary sorry eigenvalue equation is that these phi solutions should uh, should be normalizable that, that means that the inner the norm given by the inner product i just defined some slides uh, before uh, should be finite so if that's the case lambda it's time independent the uh, the non stationary eigenfunctions depend explicitly on time so we can see that here we have a, a similar Sorry, problem. I'd like to understand your equation that you wrote DDT on the left. You probably mean DI DT on the left. Yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah. It's DI over DT. Yeah, it's a typo, sorry. Yeah, so yeah, this is uh, well the total derivative. And yeah, so we recover uh, an eigenvalue problem. Uh, and now these the solutions are uh, well depend explicitly on time. But the problem is, well, we have this eigenvalue problem, so how these phi solutions are related to the solutions of the Schrodinger equation because in the end that's the problem we want to solve the Schrodinger equation so well it can it may be proved it can be proved that if we add to these eigenfunctions and a time dependent phase given by this and this a uh, chi phase is uh, satisfies this equation right here so this phi uh, function uh, fulfills the Schrodinger equation so we can see that now the problem is more is, is well it's more complex because we we need to find the uh, the quantum invariant AI. We have to solve the spectral problem for I. Then we have to find the phase, and with that we can generate the solutions to the Schrödinger equation. So the, the problem right now it's it's getting much more complex, but it's still we can uh, gen uh, we can exploit the, the solutions are really known for the parametric oscillator and use it uh, to generate new time dependent models so uh, this is uh, basically the main part of my talk and how to do it, it is uh, in the case of shape invariant systems so uh, this well this diagram basically summarizes uh, what, what is the technique we are going to use uh, we will depart from a quantum invariant, which is I1. This uh, quantum invariant will be the, the one related to the parametric oscillator plus an additional arbitrary function of x and t, position and time. So we will find, uh, well, we know that this quantum invariant satisfies an eigenvalue problem. So we will find a shape invariant condition and, and uh, an opaque or a dagger such that I1 is related to I1 plus to lambda. And th in this relationship is given by this equation. Uh, uh, sorry, no, this is I2. Uh, and we, we have also, sorry, a new quantum invariant. This is just an auxiliary one to uh, ease the calculations. And I1 and I2 are, re are related through these uh, intertwining relationships. So from here, we can see that uh, this a dagger operator is a ladder operator for I1, and it displaces the eigenvalues uh, by two, two lambda units right here. Uh, the general condition we impose on a dagger is that a dagger is a third order differential operator, a third order in the spatial coordinate. So this is the only condition. So the problem right now uh, here will be to find which is uh, what is the explicit form for I1 and what is the Hamiltonian H1 because this is not a uh, given yet. So we will depart did, from the- Did I invariant. miss something or did you define what is meant by shape invariance? Uh, yeah, actually I will talk about the next slide about uh, what is exactly uh, shape invariant. So here I'm just depicting the, uh, the main procedure. But yeah, I'm talking about shape invariance in the next slide. So, and this red line is, is an special case, which is something we will call uh, the irreducible, the reducible case, sorry. And I will talk about this again in a moment. So I will use this same uh, diagram in, 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 in the next slides, just to make easier to follow the calculations. So, well, as uh, well, Professor Jung uh, just pointed out, uh, well, uh, in order to be clear, here I'm just presenting what's the idea of shape invariance. 
So in the context of the factorization method I just presented at the beginning, we have two Hamiltonians, right, which are related uh, through the uh, factorization operators. Uh, each one of these Hamiltonians define a potential. So if the potentials defined by this factorization are given uh, by this relation, so we say that they are shape invariant. Notice that the only difference between the potential B minus, let's consider B minus B the initial potential, and B plus the new one, the only difference is this, uh, they are displaced by this parameter. And this S uh, depends only on this parameter C, which are arbitrary. It depends in every case. For instance, in the oscillator case, it could be the frequency. And for other system, it could be any other arbitrary parameter. But the important uh, point here is that S do not depend on X. It's just, uh, it, depend it just depends on the parameters. So this is what sorry, this is what we mean by shape invariance. And this idea is, has been well established. It's even in, well, in, in this reference, for instance, they discuss in more detail how to use this to generate stationary systems. However, if for time-dependent problems, the, the idea is not so straightforward. So in order to deal with the time-dependent case, uh, we will consider the quantum invariance rather than the Hamiltonian. So if we have a quantum invariant, let's say I minus, and we have another I, I, I plus, so we say that these two are a shape invariant each other if they differ only on a constant. And this constant, again, can, be, can depend, might depend, sorry, on the parameters of this invariance. But these do not depend neither on time or, uh, or the spatial variable. So this is the extension of a shape invariant for a time-dependent system. And this translates, well, if we uh, translate this into the Hamiltonians, well, this means that the related Hamiltonian, uh, you uh, remember that each invariant is related to a time-dependent Hamiltonian. So this means that the Hamiltonians differ only on a, a arbitrary function of time. And this is the realization. This might depend on time, but not depend on, on the position. So this is something we actually exploited uh, in previous work, and this was a, a, the main idea to generate uh, new solvable systems related to the uh, singular oscillator, for instance. But in this case, uh, we will exploit this property in the context of a shape invariant. So again, each one of these quantum invariants uh, the, uh, are related to, uh, well, to their respective Hamiltonians, H, J, and all of them satisfy this uh, invariant condition, which is, this is why we call them quantum invariants. And also each one of these quantum invariants satisfy an eigenvalue equation like this. So, uh, well, and remember, I1 is the invariant we are looking for. I2 is just an auxiliary one. Actually, we will not take care on I2, just on I1. And the, we will say that the solution, the non-stationary eigenfunctions are defined by the finite norm condition like this. And this inner product, again, is the same we defined from the beginning. So we will use uh, the same physical inner product. Okay. So, uh, well, the, by doing so, we will introduce these uh, this uh, this intertwining relationships, and these uh, these ones are well, these are the ones who, that define the shape invariant condition. This this equation means that the eigen uh, this a dagger is a creation operator for the eigenfunctions of i one, and a is an annihilation operator for the eigenfunctions of i one and they displace the eigenvalues just by two units. Uh, again, uh, at this point, we are going to work just on the, qu and the quantum invariance. And afterwards, once we solve all the pro of the spectral problem of I1, we will construct what is the uh, time-dependent Hamiltonian related to this uh, function. So, in order, well, in order to give um, be more, more explicit about these quantum invariants, uh, we will decompose it as the sum of the parametric oscillator invariant plus an arbitrary function on x and t, and explicitly they are given by this. 
So the spectral problem we, we will have to solve is given by these operators, are basically the eigenfunctions of this second order differential equation on X with, with uh, time dependent coefficients. And this sigma function, uh, it's related uh, to the Ermakov equation like this. So, uh, well, this is a, a pretty standard uh, method for the parametric oscillator. And the time dependent, you can see here that the time dep uh, dependent frequency appears in the Ermakov equation. So, uh, this is an, uh, clearly, this is a nonlinear equation, but this equation has been a studied quite extens extensively. So it, it is well known that the solutions for this Ermakov equation are given by this, where Q1 and Q2 are two linearly independent solutions of the linear equation related uh, to sigma. By this, I mean a, a, a differential equation, which is equal to zero. Notice that if, if this term is zero, we have a linear equation. So these Q1 and Q2 are precisely solutions to the, homoge uh, to the linear case of sigma. So if we find two of these linear independent solutions, we get sigma and with sigma, we, we get basically the, define this uh, time dependent coefficient. But still we, we need to find what is R and R1 and R2 given uh, here. So, well, R is, is just this uh, quantity, but R1 and R2 are unknown to this point. So these are the functions we are going to look for. Okay, so uh, the la these ladder operators are intertwining. So there's something that on your transparency that are not consistent. Sometimes you call it R1, sometimes two. Oh, you have Rj and J is one or two? Yeah, exactly, yeah, here, yeah. J is one or two, depending on the case. Yeah, because notice here that we have uh, two quantum invariants, ij, where, where j is one or, or two, sorry. So yeah, we have two, uh, for each i, we have a, a unknown r. So it will depend on, uh, de uh, on which one are we referring. So sorry, if you know sigma or q mm -hmm. and q and q2, how do you find r1, r2? Oh yeah, that's, the, 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 that's what I, I will explain, yeah. Uh, that's the main point of the problem, to find R1 R2. I will explain in, uh, in the next slide. So, yeah, precisely to find R1 and R2, uh, we will use, uh, well, they, they will be fine from this uh, intertwining relation here, because, uh, well, we have this third order ladder operator. We have here, well, R1 is, is unknown. So if we compute both sides of this equation, uh, along with the, uh, let me show you, along with this other equation. So we will get a, a complete set of equations that allow us to get explicitly R1 and R2. I will explain the, the steps in, in this slide. So first we decompose this uh, third order ladder operator as the product of a first order one and a second order one. The first order is Q and the second order is uh, M. So uh, by doing so, we get uh, these intertwining relations. And this is how we relate, uh, relate R1 and R2, because here uh, R1 is included in this operator and R2 is included here. So th these are obtained just for the, from the diagram I showed at the beginning. So uh, this is the, these are the set of equations that will allow us to get all the, uh, the, the explicit for, for R1 and R2. And uh, here, uh, well, following uh, some results we found in this previous paper, we consider uh, this Q operator as, uh, well, as, as this for where omega is a complex value function. For stationary cases, this has been done in a similar fashion, but if for stationary cases, sigma is one, and this omega, uh, it, well, omega is just a, uh, a function, a real value function of X. So in order to introduce the time dependence on the construction, we need to introduce a complex value function, omega, and also a, a function that depends on, on the time as well. So by after, uh, also for the operators B, which are the second order ones, second order differential operators, we give uh, this explicit form. So again, J, uh, G, sorry, and B are complex, 
time dependent functions. So uh, we will, uh, after substituting this M, M and dagger, Q and Q dagger into this first set of equations, which is a large procedure. So I will just give uh, the results. We get that omega G and B can be separated in, in this form where this capital uh, uh, W is a real value function. This capital G is also a real value function and capital B as well is a real value function. And all of them depend explicitly on time uh, through this uh, reparameterization. We introduce here a variable which is called z, uh, that is x over sigma. And sigma, again, is solution to the Ermakov equation. So uh, just by using the intertwining relation and these third order ladder operators, we get this set of equations, sorry, this new uh, reparameterization. And omega, g, and b are given by this set of equations. So the procedure is it's a bit tedious, it's a bit long, but in the end, this is, uh, these are the main equations we get. You can see here how we construct R1 and R2 in terms of um, uh, W, G, uh, well, and these parameters. Here, D and gamma are just a constant of integration. So both D and G do not depend neither on X or T. And we also get this set of complementary equations. So the calculation, again, we can combine the complementary equations with the, uh, this set of four equations. And in the end, this is the, the important equation we will get. We will get a differential equation for G, which is nonlinear, and it takes this form. So after introducing this reparameterization, given here, we get a final equation. And this is the, the one we are looking for, uh, omega, uh, lowercase omega. You can see here that uh, this is the fourth Pinelab equation. So the only thing we need right now is uh, it's to find solutions to this omega. By doing so, we generate a solution G, capital G. With capital G, uh, we, uh, here we generate a capital W. And with capital W, we generate uh, R1 uh, from this equation and R2 as well. So this, uh, in summary, we only need to find the solution to the Ermakov equation. With that, and could you recall what the relationship between y, z, x, and t are? Y, z, oh, okay, yeah, it's here. Uh, sigma depends on time, and it's the solution to the Ermakov equation. So z is equal to x over sigma. And what uh, is y? Sorry? What is y? Uh, Ah, yeah, sorry. Uh, why it's it's just a re, uh, it's just a re rescaling of. Let me see here. Oh, it's yeah. just a rescaling of set because we have this arbitrary parameter lambda. So it's it's just a simple rescale. So yeah. The, so in the end, it's well, y is proportional to set. So by finding solutions to this uh, Pound-Lewy equation, we have the problem completely identified. And well, the the one of the main advantages of using the Pinelab equation is that Pinelab equations has several hierarchies of solution. And each one of these hierarchies generate in, in, uh, different interesting problems in the physical context. So uh, we will discuss what, what are especially these, uh, or what are these special solutions. So now, well, uh, just uh, summarizing, we, uh, by finding uh, the solution to the Pinelab equation, we find I1, I2, and with this, uh, sorry, I1 and I2, and with this, we, uh, we only need to find what is the uh, Hamiltonian and the solutions. But so, you haven't uh, said what omega t is, so are you saying that for any omega t, you always have a final of A4 equation? It, exactly, for any, any omega t, as long as we solve the Ermakov equation. So uh, omega t is involved in sigma, in, in a way. So if, if but, but this construction is general for any omega of t. Of course, the problem will be if I impose a complicated omega, so the solution sigma will be a bit difficult to get. But in general, this is true for any omega. So yeah, this is a pretty uh, general in, the, in this regard. So, okay, so, well, now let, let us discuss a bit about the uh, spectrum related to I1. So, well, in, in this case, uh, we will uh, decompose, well, 
in, in the previous case, we considered the irre irreducible case, which means the M is not factorized as a product of two lower order operators. But in this case, uh, just to simplify the calculations and to present some specific examples, we will consider the, uh, the case in which M is indeed factorized by two first order operators. So in, in this case, the procedure is, is the same and I will not repair the, the procedure because you can see that M1 and M2 take the exact form as in the, in the previous case, but now we have omega one, sorry, W1 and W2. But, the, but again, the procedure is completely the same. So it, it's, it's not so relevant to introduce all the intermediate calculation. The important point here is that we can introduce a third, uh, well, a second auxiliary uh, in a quantum invariant. And in this way, uh, we can uh, find the spectral problem for I1 just by using a simple mappings given by M1 dagger and M1, M2 dagger and Q dagger. So uh, to, to summarize all this procedure, we can take this diagram. All, all these equations involve the M1, M2, Q, and so on are, are pretty much uh, summarized in this diagram. So we generate uh, three quantum invariants. Each one of them generates an, uh, uh, a vector space. So the solutions for we are looking for uh, is uh, the, this H1, which is the vector space H1. So one immediate solution for H1 is uh, given by the annihilation operator Q. So the eigenvalues of Q generates a first solution uh, to, the, uh, to this quantum invariant. But we have to re remember that uh, A dagger, which is the, an A, sorry, which is the annihilation operator, is a third order operator. So we must find three uh, different solutions. This is the first one. The second solution is given by the eigenfunctions of M2 dagger. So by finding this, we can get uh, the respective solution by using this map in Q dagger. So this eigenfunction is mapped to another solution of the quantum invariant. And the third solution is just given by the, by the second auxiliary invariant and it's an eigenfunction of M1 dagger. And then we can map it back to H1 by these two mapping operators. So in the end, uh, this simplifies uh, the problem of, of finding these uh, eigenvalues of A, because otherwise we will have to solve a third order differential equation. Uh, that will be a bit more complicated. And in this way, we reduce the problem to just simple first order operators in mappings, and that's pretty much it. So uh, in the end, after doing some calculations, the three solutions are just given by these quadratures. Of course, we will need to solve these integrals involving omega. Remember that omega is related, uh, sorry, W is related to the solution of the Pine-Levy equation. So if we solve these three equations, we get uh, the, the something we call the zero modes. These are only the lowest solutions of the invariant. We can find the higher modes just by using the ladder operator A dagger, let's say. And this is something we explain here. So by using A dagger, we generate the rest of the spectrum as long as we get this uh, zero mode. We, we should keep an eye on these solutions because if these solutions are not square integrable, so they, if they don't have a, a finite norm, so they are not useful for in the context of, of quantum mechanics. So we, we, we need to analyze whether or not these solutions are physical. If they are physical, we include it in the spectrum. And if, in, if that's the case, the eigenvalues of the quantum invariant are just given by, this, uh, by these values here. So yeah, with this, what we find the, the zero modes, which again are the lowest eigenfunctions for this uh, operator. And of, of course, it, it, the, the explicit form will depend on the solutions of the Pine-Levy equation. Uh, I will discuss uh, the, some particular cases in the in upcoming slides. Uh, in, in this case, it's interesting that also we can find uh, eigenval eigenfunctions for the creation operator. If we find an eigenfunction for the creation operator that has a finite norm, this, this means that the spectrum is truncated in, in, in a way. 
So in general, uh, I, I'm just here providing the most general expressions because then, because then we can just introduce some specific values. But in general, the, the three eigenfunctions for the creation operator are just given by these three uh, equations. You can see that in a way, if uh, if one of these, if this, if, if this exponential, for instance, it converges to zero and the asymptotics, which in, in, will give us a, a square integrable function, you can see that here it will diverge because the, the exponential has the uh, opposite sign. So if if this is a physical solution, this one is not a physical solution. So we will have to play with this, uh, with, with, with this behavior. And the eigenfunctions related to this, uh, the eigenvalues sorry, related to these modes are also given by this. So uh, with this, uh, we, have basic, uh, we have find the lowest solutions for the quantum invariant, and we also have the eigenvalues. So the only part left uh, to compute it's basically are sorry the time dependent Hamiltonians. Uh, well, this procedure is a, a bit large, so I don't think I have enough time to explain in detail. But the main idea to construct the uh, time dependent Hamiltonian involves the construction of the uh, time evolution operator. If we if we have the solutions of the complete basis for the quantum invariant we can generate the, the, the evolution operator just by using this, uh, uh, this uh, sum. So by doing this and after uh, uh, applying some calculations, we get that H is just given by this. H is proportional to the quantum invariant plus a function that, in, that depends on F. And this function can be simplified even more. And in the end, we get this. So this is the final expression we, we need for the uh, time-dependent Hamiltonian. It's a, a kinetical term here and a time-dependent potential. And the time-dependent potential is the parametric oscillator part plus the R function. So that's why we need these R functions as well. They, they define the quantum invariance, but they also define the time-dependent potentials. So th th this is the relevance of these functions. And as well as you can recall, the eigenfunctions are related to the solutions of the Schrodinger equation by a complex phase here. So in this case, the complex phase is given in general by, by this quantity. And again, Q, Q1 and Q2 are the linear solutions for the Ermakov equation I just presented before. So notice that with this, we are really found the quantum invariant, the solutions, the eigenvalues and the complex phase. So the problem is completely solved. Of course, this is quite general. This is valid for any omega of t. So in order to give some light on the procedure, I will discuss some uh, specific examples. And this is a, a summary uh, of what, what we need. We need to solve omega. We need to solve sigma, which is the Ermakov equation with this, we generate a new potential. In, in this case, it takes this explicit form. And, and this is the new uh, system we are constructing. <clears throat> so particular cases, and this is uh, something interesting. For instance, uh, because you can see here that we can solve the Ermakov equation and the Pinelab equation independently. I mean, I don't need the solutions of the uh, Ermakov equation to solve Pinelab, and neither I need Pinelab to solve Ermakov. So I can solve, in a way, uh, I can just specify sigma of t, solve sigma, and this is completely independent of uh, the Pinelab equation. So in, in these examples, I will just discuss the, uh, the solutions of the Ermakov to begin with. Uh, this is the simplest case. Let's say that the frequency is just one. So this is interesting because even if the frequency is one, sigma is in general a time-dependent function and the, and the resulting Hamiltonian is time-dependent. And this is something we noticed in the previous work because we realized that by factorizing the quantum invariant rather than the Hamiltonian in the stationary case, we can generate a more a general a Hamiltonian. And, and that property is reflected here, that I, I, even if the frequency is a constant, sigma depends on time. And it's, uh, moreover, it's a, a periodic function of t. 
And in this case, we get that the class of solution or of systems which are usually described by the Floquet theory. And the complex phase I just mentioned uh, in, the, in the previous slide, this complex phase in this particular case becomes the Floquet, the Floquet phase of this uh, theory. So everything matches just perfectly. And this, from this general solution, it's clear that if A and C are both equal to one, so this term vanishes, this term vanishes, and, base, and sigma is just one. So the stationary limit is achieved with a sigma equal to one and A equal to C equal to one. And in that case, the set variable is just X. So we find here how to reduce all these general construction for time dependent system to the stationary case. But for other values of A and C, or even um, uh, omega of t, the, the resulting systems are time dependent. <clears throat> another, just, uh, another solution we can find is given by this frequency, which is a hyperbolic tangent. And uh, this pre uh, describes pretty, pretty much a, a transition from a frequency, which is a constant, and then it smoothly changes to another constant. If you remember the behavior from the a hyperbolic tangent function. It's just base, it's just a, like a smooth version of this step function. So we here, we are basically uh, making a smooth transition between two different frequencies. And the most general solutions are given by Q1 and Q2 here, and sigma is in general this expression. Uh, the, uh, this, there is a special limit here, and it's given by K going to infinity. For k equal to infinite, this converges to the step distribution or the, or the step function. And all this construction reduces to the sudden approximation of quantum mechanics. But for other values of k, we have exact solutions, which are well, exact and smooth solutions for the quantum invariant and the Hamilton. So, well, these are just two examples of the uh, time-dependent solutions for the Ermakov group, which are, well, are oscillatory, but not periodic. So, and finally, well, uh, the solutions to the pan level for the equation. So we will discuss three different cases, the Riccardi-like uh, solutions, the irrational solutions, and the nonlinear uh, bound states for the uh, pan level for equation. So if we recall from the Pan-Lev equation, we have two free parameters, alpha and beta, which in, in, the, in our problem are defined by gamma and D are proportional, are just the, uh, proportional each other. So if B it's constrained in this to this uh, Riccardi equation given here, where mu, okay, mu squared is equal to one, which means that uh, mu is equal to pl plus minus one. And in, in, in this case, we can simply linearize omega just by using the conventional procedure for the uh, Riccardi equation. And in the end, we get a put, uh, well, uh, we get the solutions through this uh, linear equation. And, and this is uh, pretty straightforward uh, to solve. So uh, we have two different solutions, uh, mu equal to one and mu equal to minus one. If we fix mu equal to one, the resulting potential is something like this. And notice that it, uh, this resulting potential is nothing but the parametric oscillator plus a function of time. But by definition, we say from the beginning that this is a shape invariant. So this is one of the trivial solutions we get from the Riccardi equation, and, it, and this is just uh, a shape invariant in the time-dependent context. So we will we are not interested in these solutions at all. And the on the other hand, for mu equal to minus one, we get a, a more complex potential. So that new potential is just given by uh, what the parametric oscillator part plus this, which is given by uh, the solutions of the Pilot equation. And omega can be uh, constructed, as you remember, by this logarithm derivative. And these u functions are just uh, the general solution u is given by this linear combination. And each u, u1 and u2 are just these two fun uh, hypergeometric functions here. And in general, we can provide up, uh, this, uh, this condition 
this condition uh, uh, means that this function u do not have any zeros. Notice that if, if you have zeros, omega has a singularity, and if omega has a singularity, the potential and the solutions will have singularities. So those, uh, especially those cases are, well, in the physical context, are not interesting because they will lead to non-physical solutions. So if we stick to this, uh, to this constraint, we will get uh, physical solutions. And in general, the zero modes are just given, oh, sorry, by this. Among all the zero modes we found previously, we realized that only one has, uh, sorry, only two have a finite norm. The other solutions uh, diverges and in, in infinite, so they are not considered in the spectrum. And this is the most general expression. So here we can see that this is why u is all, it must be uh, different from zero, because here otherwise we will have a singularity in this uh, zero mode. So summarizing this uh, Riccati case, we have uh, this, uh, but the spectrum is classified by this. We have something which we call a singlet. Uh, this singlet is an eigenfunction of both a and a dagger, and we have an infinite sequence, which is generated by this eigenfunction of A. The remaining val uh, eigenfunctions are just generated by, by using the uh, ladder operator, in this case, the creation A dagger. And these two eigenvalues cannot be uh, related. That's why we call this a singlet, because if we apply the creation operator over this eigenfunction, we annihilate the solution. And if we use A, as well, we annihilate the solution. So that, that, that's why this is uh, isolated from the rest of the spectrum. And that's why we call to this a specific solution a singlet. So it's a singlet and an infinite sequence. Uh, well, here I have some specific solutions to the Riccati equation, but well, I, I will not discuss this in detail because there is not much time left. But in, in summary, the, this is an error function like a solution these are uh, rational solutions. This is a particular case of the, ne of the next one. And well, and basically this is, these are the kind of solutions we can generate by pine level. It, it is work to re recall that some of these solutions has been previously obtained for stationary systems. So these ones generate the, so the, the systems uh, obtained, for instance, in this reference, uh, well, this error function generalized this potential. And, this particular case has been also uh, found previously in this reference well. Now uh, well, uh, we will discuss another special uh, case, which are the rational solutions. Uh, for, in the case of pi level four, it, it is well known that there are three hierarchies of rational solution. And all the rational solutions of the pi level four equation are given by these three hierarchies. The problem with these hierarchies is that most of these uh, solutions have zeros in the real line. And as we mentioned previously, if the solutions have zeros, uh, we will generate singularities. So in order to solve this problem, uh, among all the rational solutions we have, uh, we have the only one that uh, generates physical problems is, rela uh, is related to the minus two y first hierarchy. And the solutions to the pi level equation are just given by this. Omega is just this. And Q is uh, it, it's known as the Okamoto polynomial. So uh, the, the Okamoto polynomials have zeros, but the zeros of these polynomials are in the complex plane. In the real line, they don't have any zeros. So that's why these solutions generate uh, uh, physical uh, potential. These Okamoto polynomials are, well, they are not orthogonal, contrary to conventional orthogonal polynomials. Uh, Okamoto polynomials are not orthogonal in the real line, at, at, at least. So, it, and they are generated by this uh, nonlinear recurrence relation. So, by using these two boundary conditions, we can generate any uh, Okamoto polynomial of any order. So, in, in, in this case, just to be, just to give an example, uh, we fix m equal to two, so we need the Okamoto polynomial three and the Okamoto polynomial two. And in particular, we get uh, this as a solution, and these are, are the eigenfunctions, and these uh, last one are the eigenvalues. Uh, 
in uh, it, it is worth to mention that in, well, in in a recent work we we have found a close expression for any value of a n so in this case is just to provide an example we fix m equal to two but this can be generalized in expressions for these zero modes has been found for any values of n so in all these solutions are always well defined regardless of the value of n and the the behavior of the spectrum in this case is given by this uh, contrary to the previous case here we have three infinite sequences of solutions uh, and the first hand we have this C, uh, phi zero which is the first sequence and they are depicted by these uh, blue lines so all of these solutions are connected by ladder operators a dagger and this is the one we get from the zero mode the next zero mode is given by this uh, orange line which is phi three and the next zero mode is phi four, which is the green line. And we can see here that the spectrum has exactly two gaps. And notice that in this case, we have fixed M equal to two. So in general, and that's something we have already proved, uh, for any M, we will generate M gap, M gaps, uh, gaps sorry, in the, in the spectrum. So this is a general property for uh, the rational uh, solutions of the pine level four. And the last one is just, well, the nonlinear bound state. So it turns out that uh, this, uh, the pine level equation can be taken into the nonlinear oscillator equation given by nu if we perform this reparametrization. By doing so, uh, we can solve this in terms of, uh, of iterative solutions, sorry. And one essential property of this eta function is that they come uh, for large values of x, you can see here that they behave like a Gaussian function. So this means that eta uh, are square integrable and they, uh, and they have exactly k zeros. So for eta k, the solution has exact, uh, sorry, eta n, the solution, the solution has exactly n zeros. But uh, in, uh, asymptot asymptotically speaking, they converge to zero. So they are square integrable. And these eta functions, well, the problem with this is they cannot, they are not given in an explicit form. So they should be computed uh, iteratively and we depart from this uh, error function solution. So if we introduce this eta k zero here, we generate eta k one. So if we use eta k1 in this same equation, we generate eta k2 and so on. So there is no close expression for these solutions. And well, we need to tr truncate the procedure just by uh, fixing any value of n. And well, just to uh, provide an example, this, uh, this is the behavior of these eta k solutions. And as, as I mentioned previously, they have a well-defined number of zeros. If we use these solutions into the pine level equation, we generate this another uh, sequence of solutions. Uh, in this case, we have just an infinite sequence, but here we have a, a finite sequence, contrary to the previous case in which we, we had uh, three infinite sequences. Here we have a finite one. And this, uh, the, the dimension of this subspace is given precisely by n. If n is equal to zero, we generate the solution uh, given by the Riccati equation I, I just mentioned previously. Let's just let me read. Oh, yeah. Sorry, this one. So for n equal to zero, recover this specific case, but for any other arbitrary values of n, we generate uh, well, uh, 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 this I can, a function is annihilated by a dagger. I can move to higher modes just by using a dagger. But here, this uh, eigenfunction is annihilated by a dagger. So that's why these two, uh, these two eigenfunctions are isolated each other because the ladder operators do not connect the spectrum. And this eigenfunction is generated by a dagger, a, sorry, is annihilated by a, and the rest of the eigenvalues are just iterative actions of a dagger. So this is how we generate all the solutions. So when in these three cases, uh, well, this is just the behavior of the potential for the Okamoto polynomial case and for the nonlinear uh, case. Uh, in, uh, well, here I have used the frequency omega equal to one, but I, can, I could introduce the solution even in terms of the hyperbolic tangent function. 
and can be introduced here with no problem. But it, this is just to exemplify my, my results. And these are the eigenfunctions of the quantum invariant. So, well, the probability distributions, sorry. Uh, so, well, this is the behavior. And, well, so in, with this in mind, well, we have, uh, well, after finishing all, all this work, uh, there are several well, perspectives. And on the one hand, we, we realize that the Okamoto polynomial case can be generated, and that's something we are, we are almost finishing. And in that particular case, there, there is a strict relation with the exceptional Hermit polynomial. So this is an extension that we found from the result of this paper. On the other hand, there is an interesting connection with the nonlinear bound states, because in the stationary case, this relates uh, the pine level four equation with a nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So in this case, we introduce the time dependence on the nonlinear bound state. So it's still open whether there exists a nonlinear Schrodinger equation uh, that depends on time, which is related to the solution we just got uh, in this uh, section. So this is just a perspective. This is something we are still looking for, and what well, perhaps we'll report in, in a future uh, talk. So these are the, the main references we use in this uh, work, and well, it, it, I'm now open to any questions. So thanks. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Do we have thanks, any man. questions? Yes, Veronique, uh, I would, uh, yeah. if I could. Yeah. Uh, I have a comment and a question. Uh, the mm -hmm. comment, is, I don't know if it's uh, relevant to what you've done, but uh, I was first uh, taught uh, or educated about the Ermakov uh, equation by uh, Sergei Suslov. It was written a number of papers uh, maybe 10 years ago. So you mm -hmm. might want just to check them out to see he had re related that to the Berger's equation and, and stuff like that. Okay. So my, my question is the following. Uh, the uh, pain of a four equation has a beautiful group of uh, uh, backlund transformation. It's actually the, the vial group of the uh, affine uh, SL3. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so you nod, so is what bearing can this have on your setup? In other words, these symmetries, how do they translate then into your systems? Yeah, actually that, that's something we are really exploited uh, because in, in the nonlinear case, let's say, we implicitly, we have used the backlog transformation. So this re uh, recurrence relation we have here is actually a backlog transformation. It is the combination of two different backlog transformations, uh, to be precise, which is special because it preserves beta equal to zero. Uh, usually, the backlog transformation modifies the, the parameters of the four pine level equation, you know, alpha and beta. So, if, if we have a seed function, let's say, for a given alpha and a given beta, the backlog transformation generates solutions for other alphas and other betas. So, in this particular case, we are exploiting this precisely fact because we know what's the solution of beta equal to zero and alpha equal to, I think it's, uh, I don't remember the value, minus two, I think. So we know this a special solution and we generate any other just by, by long transformations. So yeah, in a way it's implicit in these uh, calculations. But anything on the general structure that uh, you see tr relating the, the, the vial symmetry to, to your construction? Hmm. Well, well, in, this, in, that, uh, well hmm. in that general case, I'm not sure, to be honest. Yeah, because well, I haven't think about it, that special symmetry. But I mean, if they, uh, if they generate another solution, well, it would be interesting. Because uh, uh, there is something I didn't mention, it, but, and perhaps it would be interesting to mention right now. All the cases of pine level four I'm dealing with are uh, cases in which beta is either zero or negative. I haven't explored cases for positive beta. So I'm not sure if this kind of symmetry will allow me to get a Baglone transformation that moves me to the beta, a positive beta case. So I, I, I'm not, uh, uh, to be honest, I don't know if this symmetry would be useful in this way. If so, well, it would be, it would be better to explore in the future world. 
Thank you. Yeah. Professor Pali. Yeah. Another uh, question? I have a question. Uh, the question is about the relation between this program and a similar program for uh, time, time independent Hamiltonians. Uh, it's one that was, I think, started by uh, Veselov and and Shabbat, maybe, <coughs> and continued by, well, in particular, Ian Market, who was a co-author, and and uh, and Gungor and Kuru and and Tus and Nieto and Negro, yeah. and in both of these programs, the potentials. That are uh, that are related to Pendleby transcendence make an important appearance. Now, uh, one way of generating these uh, these Pendleby uh, these Pendleby potentials uh, is to start from a Hamiltonian in one dimension, mm -hmm. the same one as you have, and from an integral of motion. Let's call it K, uh, and from an integral of motion that is of some order first, second, third, and and so on. And one requires that in one dimension, these these two operators form an algebra, mm -hmm. yeah, which can either be an abelian algebra, they can commute, or a Heisenberg algebra, they can equal to, be equal to a constant, or they can be proportional to the integral of motion or to the Hamiltonian. Yeah. Now, from this, you doing is, well, requiring that you have this algebra, you can then use it uh, to generate superintegrable systems with mm -hmm. integrals of motion of arbitrary order uh, in in multi dimensions. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm somewhat perplexed by your answer to John, saying that the potential, the dependence on t, can be arbitrary, but there must be something in somewhere in an assumption that that makes that leads to the Pendleby transcendence and, and that leads to to integrability in some sense so where is where is that made yeah well uh, well the potential is not arbitrary it's the frequency the arbitrary function of time it's not the potential it's just the frequency and precisely and this frequency is, that is the frequency oh uh, yes uh, sure let me just give the general expression sorry here, this frequency, it's omega of t. So this is arbitrary, and this is defined by the Ermakov equation here. So that's why th these two are unrelated. I mean, I can solve these, one, these two independently. So this is the arbitrary function uh, on time, but the potential is not arbitrary. The potential is defined precisely by both the solution of Ermakov and Pine level four. So mm -hmm. When I look at it, I see one is equal to omega square t times x square. Mm -hmm. Minus. And t minus t. other stuff. But there is this arbitrary function of, of t there. Yeah, yeah. Omega is arbitrary function of t. Yeah. I mean, well, as long as this is positive. So, so the Pendleby transcendence come up from the, the nonlinearity in the Yermakov equation. Yeah, well, actually, from the uh, from the reparametrization, let me show you. Yeah, because previously we we introduced an special reparametrization, which uh, allow us to get uh, this separation, this one. So when we introduce these uh, uh, intertwining operators, we get a set of coupled equations. They are coupled in x, t, and so on. So a simple way to de decouple of all these system of equations is given by this reparametrization. And by doing this, uh, we can write all the set of equations in terms of set. And then the Pinelab equation is defined only by set in explicitly. So the Pinelab equation is an implicit function of x and t given by this relation. But the Pinelab equation itself is defined by set or y, because y is just a rescaling of set. So that's why they are independent. But uh, Implicitly speaking, uh, the, solu uh, the solution of Pan-Lebe depends on t and, and sigma so, so here, because y, you know, uh, here y is equal to x over sigma, and sigma is solution to this. So yeah, they, they are related, but, but uh, we can solve these two independently. That, that's my main point. 
So uh, regarding the, the previous work you mentioned with Ian actually and, and others, and even Andrianov in Kanata, yeah, uh, they, uh, in, the, in this general construction, we recover this, uh, the stationary case uh, just by using this sigma. And this is why sigma is arbitrary. So by using sigma equal to one, we generate this uh, omega, sorry, by using omega equal to one, we generate this sigma. And if A and C are both equal to one, so we remove all the time dependency of the system and we recover the stationary case. So this is how we recovered the previous work uh, that you mentioned. And the multidimensional case, uh, uh, that's something we haven't explored yet. In, so I'm not sure how to, at this point, I haven't explored the possibility of extending this to two-dimensional system, for instance. But I mean, uh, in the case of the uh, parametric oscillator, there are extensions of the parametric oscillator to two dimensions. So um, the procedure could be quite similar in that case, but I haven't explored it yet, to be honest. Anyway, in the time independent case, depending mm -hmm. on what order this operator K has, you get all of the Pendleve transcendents, uh, one, two, three, four, five, all except six. Oh, and the wow. six you get when you do something similar, basically in radial coordinates. Mm -hmm. Ah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, yeah, yeah. That's something interesting. I, I, I knew that I, we can generate pine level two and other pine levels by just by changing the order of this op factorization operator. But I, I, I wasn't aware about it. That it was quite general for the six pine levels. So yeah, the the only issue with here with the time dependent case is that we have to depart from any specific well from a manufactured, let's say, uh, manufactured quantum invariant. So that's the tricky part. And in this case, it was not quite straightforward to find the quantum invariant to begin with. But perhaps with these ideas, we can generalize to other. That's something actually we discussed with Ian uh, previously, but we are still working on it. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Professor. Thank you. So I think the time is, the time is passing. So uh, if there's no other question, we can. Uh, I will uh, have a question. Yeah. yeah hi, Kevin. Um, hi. If if I got it right, you um, you take only the case where your uh, intertwining operator splits into an operator of the second order and one of the first order. So mm -hmm. I've in, have you like looked into cases where you consider a general third order? Could that get like um, more interesting solutions in the end, more interesting um, potentials to generate? Yeah, well, actually, well, in the, in the most general third case, well, we haven't explored that case yet. And even in the second case, uh, as you might recall, I have factorized the second order as two first order operators. Yeah. So, the, the point here is that by factorizing this as two first order, we impose that beta is negative. This is a, a strict condition here. And that means that the potentials are real value. So if we move to the non-irreducible case, which means beta positive, we will introduce some complex value function. Okay. So that's something I'm, I'm, I'm also uh, looking for because perhaps there is a connection there with non-hermitian systems, for instance. Uh, you know, no Hermitian Hamiltonian with real spectrum. That's something I have explored in the past by using Ermakov equation exactly. So I'm still trying to match these two ideas of how to connect with this uh, non Hermitian case with beta positive. But for the time being, it's not clear yet. But indeed, I mean, if, if I generalize the property condition, I get more, uh, well, I get different uh, solutions. So yeah, that's true. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. So I think um, I think we can uh, we I can. Think, uh, uh, Jan Martin oui? has a question, oh, but yeah. he's, he was mute. Yeah, comment on the possibility of having a general third order operator. This is something that we have done with uh, Pavel and a previous student uh, Masume, uh, and for the this case of a third order operator, you get the same answer than if you uh, 
ask to factorize as a second and a first uh, order operator, but this is not the case, I think, if you go to uh, higher order value. And also to that other comment of Pavel on this program with the four type of system, this is something that we discussed with Kevin because the, the method that Kevin have implemented, it, it looks like some sort of separation of variable where you have a block that depends on the time variable and there is something that mix the time and the coordinate. So it would be interesting to look in these uh, cases that we have looked with uh, Masume and Pavel, how this separation could be applied to the compatibility equation uh, that you obtain from these other cases where they don't satisfy a ladder, but, but uh, Abelian, Eisenberg uh, mm -hmm. uh, ladder uh, cases. So I, I think this is where it could be interesting as well. Yeah, and Thank you, Yann. So if, if there's no other question, we can thank the speaker again and, uh, and goodbye to you all from everywhere. <laughs>